Hello and welcome to Weird Signal, a podcast about all things eerie, weird and hauntological. Wait a minute, this isn't Weird Signal, this is Buddies Without Organs. But why would I be confused about this? That's because I'm joined by... Did you just fuck it up, Sean? No, I didn't. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm... Lucy, hi. Welcome to Buddies Without Organs. Uh, I'm Sean, I'm here with Lucy from Weird Signal, and I'm also joined by my compatriot Matt. Hi. Hello, and Corey. Hey, buddies. Hey, this is our first crossover episode or um, not normal format episode or something like that. It's uh, 11 o'clock on the bank holiday Monday morning for us here in England. I I feel very tired because I stayed up late last night watching Chud with Lucy because um, I'm, I'm, I'm the pathetic sort of weak, weak-willed creature. And um, I decided we needed to just stick around <laughs> at least long enough for the early appearance of John Goodman. Yes, yes, indeed. You you did do that, didn't you, Liz? And I uh, woke you up to point him out. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we are going to be... <laughs> <laughs> See, Sean, this is the thing. Sean, John Goodman's here, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> Wake up, Sean. John's here. <laughs> I remember when, um, uh, because, oh god, because this is going to be a lot of like weird signal chaos energy in this episode. So, for people who don't listen to weird signal, we will tell you what weird signal is just on the off chance you don't know what it is in a minute. But I remember, Luce, when you came to stay with me once and we watched, um, The Last Jedi for some reason, which again, I just sort of like slept through because I'm a a sleepy old man. And you did like, I remember your voice whispering, Sean, it's Yoda! It's it's Yoda, Sean. Was Yoda in that? Yeah, yeah, it's in The Last Jedi. He appears as a force ghost. Oh, of course, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, Lucy, Lucy, tell the people at home who might not know what Weird Signal is, what Weird Signal is. Okay, so Weird Signal is a podcast that Sean and I have been doing for about three years now. Um, Nearly coming up to three years since we at least had that initial planning meeting. No, no, coming up to four four years since that. God. Uh, and yeah so we talk about films nominally in that we take a film and assign to it whatever uh, interesting angle of cultural history critical theory or just general um bullshit that we want to like attach to it and riff for upwards of three hours yeah yeah we try to keep it like we're trying to aim for like under two but it's you know it's difficult yeah. and yeah and and listeners to the show might also be familiar with the fact that like yeah we did an episode with matt that was about like two at least two and a half hours about was, hannibal yeah yeah we talked about hannibal and serial killers and all sorts of related goodness yes wholesome wholesome discussion Awesome discussion. But uh, today we are, you know, this being Bodies Without Organs, we are, of course, talking about Deleuze and Guattari. And we are going to be discussing, and I'll get the book here because I want to read the actual like, full title of it, because it being a, an essay from um, A Thousand Plateaus, it, of course, has a long title. It is 1227, Treatise on Nomadology, The War Machine, uh-huh. which is the 12th of the Thousand Plateaus. Though there aren't a thousand plateaus and a thousand plateaus, of course. Uh, so we are going to be doing our normal thing with this. We'll see how it goes. We'll see. Yeah, we'll just see how it goes, won't mm. we? And I believe um, we will we'll, we'll kick off by talking about, like, as always, our initial impressions of uh, the text. And I'm going to ask Corey to go first for that, actually. Yeah, well, one thing that, uh, that occurs to me is that this uh, essay is about 90 pages and we're doing it in one episode. And the fold is about 130 pages, and we're doing that one across three. So there's, there's a <laughs> yeah. lot in this essay. Mm. Uh, very dense, very interesting, very weird. Some entire chunks that I just skimmed over, even on my second attempt, because I just could not penetrate. But, you know, still uh, a lot of fun, uh, very entertaining. And I, f- I found a lot that kind of speaks to the current moment as well uh, in this essay. Mm. Matt, initial impressions? Um, yeah, I, I felt a bit dizzy after this one. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I was kind of struck by how often it does kind of wander off in a way that, yeah, I, I hadn't really thought about it as a, of a book within a book. Um, mm-hmm. And the fact that it is often, well, it has been like cleft apart. Like you can, you can get the nomadology on its own, published mm-hmm. by mm-hmm. someone. Um, that's uh, semiotics i used to have a, a copy of that yeah yeah um and yeah i, I kind of I, I, this is one of the chapters that i'd never really spent too much time with before 
um, kind of have an overall general view of like what they're talking about, but actually going into the details, um, yeah, an interesting experience. Mm -hmm. Lucy, initial thoughts? Um, slightly, slightly nervous that I seem to like nominally feel the most confident about this, having read <laughs> only this. <laughs> Um, and none of the other 999 or however many plateaus there are. Um, and yeah, like, I don't know, like, yeah, it's, it's a lot as a text. And I don't think it's so much like wanders off as redefines what the text is actually about mm. at multiple points mm -hmm. in the, uh, in its progression, um, which, you know, I'm hopefully going to be like, we're zeroing in on a couple of what those manifestations of this as a text are. But yeah, it also has like just serious, just outright reversals of like, well, actually, like, um, <laughs> including like quite a quite a notable one here. Um, I should just point out like like my background coming into this episode because um, I mean, normally, well, like one of the reasons I'm here is because I have, um, despite a rather like patchy, patchy academic history, um, well, like academic like um, background at the moment, I um, have like done a couple modules in war and humanitarianism. Uh, and I'm now going to be going on to like a MSc in uh, international relations, um, which is in its own way, perhaps like war studies, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, which is another point. But yeah, basically, I don't know. It was like I initially intended to like um, be the kind of outsider presence who's coming from like the political science direction to see what insights I could bring to this text. And I have found quite the opposite <laughs> <laughs> as for uh, as as for myself uh yeah really what we've all already said i mean this is something that we i think uh at least the three of us will be used to at this point when it comes to re reading the and quatari but um every essay that they write feels like a well at least every essay in a thousand plateaus feels like a microcosm for their entire philosophical project mm -hmm. just with a, a particular orientation for that moment like i realized reading this that because we'd be doing like you me matt will be coming up on like the one year anniversary of starting this podcast yeah uh in a, in a few months time and one of the things i realized reading this was that like how those particular kind of like late motifs um that you find throughout the losers thought and, and what I was thought like we're really kind of like coming out to me now so let's say yeah, okay this is like you know we have like the desert we have um uh sort of the, the, the weird bits of musical theory and the mathematical stuff uh, 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 and the extremely like wide reading of literature and fiction that just kind of percolates its way through like there's a passage from children of dune in this mm. in this essay you know it's it's um so yeah like it's and i suppose this is rhizomatic thinking though isn't it you know sort of like any plateau here can be sort of like broken off and planted and it will grow the re like the the whole mass it's uh, again won't it mm. uh but yes it is it is it's not as dense and slippery as the geology of morals which is the hardest thing that i think that we've looked at um and i, I mean i think actually we were planning on doing that as a two-part before we decided to just kind of like just like fucking go for it uh, <laughs> so we will be like so yeah like we are not going to do the entire you know plateau nomadology in this episode we are going to be you know we've just picked some bits we probably know we've been good delusians you know we've picked the bits that resonated with us the most which we found the most fruitful to engage with and have just kind of like gone from there really yeah well um we have like a rough order planned out here uh loose do you want to like take do you want to yeah take, take the lead by... and uh, to my understanding what is the war machine yeah and uh, yeah because, and, uh... yeah <laughs> all right well i mean like uh i like reviewing my notes i realized like i more kind of just collected a series of things that the war machine is not but i'm gonna kind of like hazard we're maybe, fans uh, of negative theology here yeah. go for it <laughs> hazard like a sort of tentative uh version of what it might be and then ship away at that so basically what i understand it is the war machine well First off, like, it's called Nomadology the War Machine, um, but the War Machine is not the Nomad, and the Nomad is not the War Machine. They, um, the War Machine, from what I can gather, well, is essentially, it's a machine in the sense that you have been talking about on the show for a while. It's a kind of, it's a thing that emerges in relation to a series of functions related to itself and has some sort of its own kind of agenda that's either generated by something internal or by 
reference to the other machines happening around it. Um, yeah. Yeah. When so. when when Deleuze and Guattari talk about machines, they mean machines. You know, that have like a, a, you know, breakages and redirections and haltings of flows. Yeah. Mm. So it is a kind of like abstract um, thing that exists across multiple times and geographies. Whenever there is a coming together of a series of forces associated with war. Uh, with the com- with the fighting of war, um, not specifically the outcome of war. That's a whole other thing that we need to I think get into. But the the act of war taking place, um, and um, the reason the nomad is brought up as the kind of as the key figure in this is because um, the nomad is connected to a kind of like early civilizational stage, um, and it's basically the. Um, the idea is that the nomad exi- the exist well, the nomad is the um, closest, I guess, the closest embodiment to this war machine as an entity in its in its clearest sense. But like the nomad is not the war machine itself, hmm. um, and yeah. So and so, <laughs> I guess like, that's it's 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 a thing. It's a it's a it's a moment, and it is the things associated with that moment and. Uh, the other crucial thing is that, um, and this is, I guess, going to be like the main thrust of my thing, um, that it has a very specific relationship to civilization in that um, nominally kind of it is the opposite of civilization. And this is the this is the emphasis across most of the text, but uh, is kind of reversed at the end. The idea that um, it's a thing that exists in primitive societies. It is the inhabitant of smooth spaces and its enemy is, well, it's not enemy, because that implies a kind of, like, anthropomorphized intent. It's kind of, like, its antithesis is the state, is the thing that exists in, like, straight spaces, is the thing that uh, attempts to incarcerate things and establish a kind of rigidity and a formalization. And, um, yeah, I guess, like, you know, the... I think it's just, like, it's worthwhile at this point breaking down kind of, like, why the nomad resembles that, because the nomad is a figure who exists in... Um, is a or is is not fixed to a specific geography. Moves, you know, it's in the name, you know, nomadic uh, moves around. But uh, by virtue of like the the imagined sort of lifestyle or an existence of this nomad, um, it has this kind of purity of warlike spirit to it. It's not just in terms of like physical mobility and fitness, but also just um, I guess like well. Importantly, a kind of a disconnection from um, from politics, from the affairs of state, um, from you know, it's just like it's it has its own agenda that is not that of civilization. Um, however, or you know, advanced civilization, stratified civilization. Um, however, what the um, the text kind of develops on that is is this idea that um, civilization's development uh, has. Well, I, I you know this is going on to my kind of like the later points I wanted to make, but um, I think just in in brief here, uh, what a large part of the text uh, stresses is a kind of counter history of the state, where these two fundamentally opposed um, entities uh, have ex- have kind of well, the nomad is just a thing that exists at any point in time, but states have a specific history, but the history of the you know development of the state from ancient times to modern has a densely interrelated relationship with the nomad it's um and one of and the big sort of reversal at the end is it's is how it talks about its incorporation or assimilation of the war machine to its end so despite being its opposite the state or the empire or the kind of the modern state always has some element of the war machine in it which is integral to its development and sustaining and its ability to sustain itself. Good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think, um, I think, like, I don't know, um, Matt, uh, sorry, just like, maybe a slight editorial note, we can cut this one aside, but, like, did you want to come in, Matt, like, talking about, your thing was the, um, the, fo- well, one of the earliest passages, I guess, when we're introducing the idea of the state is the fact that um, the state is a threefold thing, uh, in the um, they have this rather wonderful. Um, quite well, shall, well, shall we yeah. let Matt take the lead on? That? Yeah, yeah. So like the the threefold head of state, and or like with the third or the twofold head of state with the 
the Nomad or War Machine as a kind of loose third component to that. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I almost feel like I hadn't really thought this would be possible seeing as we're kind of jumping around I, I'm, I mean I'm talking podcast wide but <laughs> I know that we're in our in our part two of the fall that we'll come to at some point in time when we feel <laughs> ready for it <laughs> I, I, I do know that we're going to be talking about the event and I feel like that's kind of almost being prefigured here in this in Lucy and what you're talking about with this um I mean I just I, I this is this is lazy uh, I don't want to <laughs> lazy research but it just had it flickered and I googled it and so I'm on the Wikipedia page for the event in philosophy um, but they've they've got this uh, uh, for Deleuze they've got this line that he has in Nietzsche in philosophy where he talks about um, like what an event is is um, it's not well like you know you sort of saying it's a it's a moment or or there's there's some kind of eruption or I guess that maybe for war in this context is is it's that it's, it's maybe it's not an individual. I mean, this is what Deleuze says in Nietzsche of philosophy. It's, it, it doesn't refer to an individual to a person, rather to an event, that is, to the forces in their various relationships, to a proposition or phenomenon, and the genetic relationship that determines these forces. Which maybe isn't that clarifying, but if we take that, like, proposition or phenomenon to be war, I guess it's the, what are the genetic relationships that determine these forces? And the war machine, I guess, is those in that machinic sense of these different things that are plugged in together, it is that thing. But it, it but it kind of does set up this, this yeah, what I wanted to focus on, which I guess is how is that different to the individual? Do we get this strange sense where in, in talking about the nomad as a figure, um, they're kind of doing this interscalar thing where we take the, we maybe get an image in our head of the nomad as an individual, when really it's kind of more, bigger than that nomads as being like as an event in itself like a people that roams or if not roams maybe i think that i guess that one important thing to say is the it's how the nomad itself fits into a wider relation of like geography like why why would a nomadic people move you could maybe say like because of the weather when it's shit they go elsewhere and they've got their freedom to kind of have that kind of movement hmm. which i guess the state doesn't like the state likes to be a single sort of think of itself as a single sovereign being um can you tell us about the two heads of the state please yes which is that that was gonna be my next point uh, um <laughs> which i guess is I what will they not, i will of... not apologize for being the voice of discipline <laughs> <in this podcast. laughs> i mean i have questions though i mean well uh well sorry. maybe I'll, I'll 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 talk maybe that I'll, I'll try and connect this to what the this very like first passage and maybe then we can because I mean, yeah. then, then, I don't want to. Be, I'm maybe I'm, I'm putting on a man voice. Like this is a voice of authority. I guess this is my sense of it, and I don't know how correct any of this will be. But um, yeah, I guess that what is interesting then, if we, if that's how we can think about the figure of the nomad, um, this the the way that they introduce the state here is um, it's this really nice passage that I just thought I'd read out. Um, where they say that it's. Uh, Rex and, and I may be going to be butchering some pronunciations, but we'll go with it. Um, Rex and Flamen, Raj and Brahman, Romulus and Numa, Varuna and Mitra, the despot and the legislator, the binder and the organiser. Undoubtedly, these two poles stand in opposition term by term, as the obscure and the clear, the violent and the calm, the quick and the weighty, the fearsome and the regulated, the bond and the pact, etc. But their opposition is only relative, their function as a pair in alternation as though they ex they function as a, as a pair in alternation, as though they express a division of the one or constitute themselves in a sovereign unity. I won't read any more, but that's... Hmm. What that makes me think of outside of Deleuze and Guattari and speak is this idea of, like, good cop, bad cop. Um, and I guess that that's kind of, if I wanted to focus on this first chapter, it does kind of... Uh, I think you were absolutely right, Sean, when you were saying that it feels like this... this um, if this whole chapter slash mini book within a book feels like, like it, it does kind of encapsulate all of their philosophy, it's like they all seem to do. And I feel like it's interesting that though we maybe talking about geopolitics and warfare and conflict maybe sounds like an outcrop within their thinking, um, how people can navigate that kind of double bind, that double articulation of form and content which we talked about in our, chapter, our episode on geology of morals is kind of pervasive throughout a lot of their thinking. We might have even talked about it in the superiority of American literature. 
Um, Because for me, the person that comes to mind when thinking about the Nomad is ends up being um, Bartleby um, from uh, Herman Melville's short story, um, which Deleuze has an essay on called Bartleby or the Formula. And the whole thing of that story just being that... uh, which I, I don't did we, did we discuss that? I feel like we maybe have discussed that at some point. Maybe it's somewhere else. Maybe we haven't. I don't think I don't think we have. We um, might have uh, unless we brought it up on the uh, the the episode on the on superior the superior yeah. of Anglo American literature. We might have we done it in detail. So yeah. So I, I mean, I won't. I, I don't want to rehash it. But I guess these are maybe just points of reference for for listeners that maybe uh, that I think these lots of these things are connected. But the one thing to say about Bartleby is that he has this response. He's he's working in a law office. And his response to everything that he's asked to do is, I would prefer not to. Um, <laughs> and Deleuze kind of like positions that as this, that's his way of kind of escaping um, both kind of good faith requests from his employer and also any sense of discipline. doesn't matter if he's, if he's sort of approached by the good cop or the bad cop, Bartleby just kind of confuses the whole situation. And that's a kind of like rhetorical, he's like a rhetorical nomad, maybe, or like a linguistic nomad. He just escapes any attempt at capture. Um, and I feel like what they're doing in this chapter, at least to set it up in this, where they're talking about this, the, this, the state in this way, is it feels like um, we're scaling up a bit and talking about how that kind of good cop, bad cop, double articulation um, functions at a kind of higher level, where you have the kind of the good cop who represents the, the all everything that we sort of associate that's good about statehood or or the kind of you know that, that appeals to the law abiding citizen. Um, and the bad cop that kind of scares you further into the arms of the state, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And I guess it's something you can see in all of the sort of true crime stuff that we've like, that's been on Netflix the past few years, where you see how some suspect in some murder cases, maybe it's often always tends to be someone that seems to have learning difficulties, where they're sort of uh, the the good side of the state will try and gain their trust, the bad side will scare that person further into the arms of the state, and they're just immediately pincered, whether they've done the crime or not. It, they seem to be at least what they seem to end up being guilty of is just capture, um, and I guess that in a way it's uh, we're getting to uh, in this this um, it seems like one of those chapters that like that both discusses this and also like enacts it when it, where I guess it's maybe that they're talking about the slipperiness of it, of it where we can maybe Lucy you can come onto this again or when you were talking before about these about turns and these strange ways of approaching their own thesis, but. As if they're also like they're 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 talking about res- resisting capture by resisting capture, um, even the sort of being captured by us as readers, um, and things like that. So I mean that's kind of what I won't kind of maybe we we can unpack some of that going forwards or maybe it'll come back. But I just kind of wanted I think that's maybe an interesting foundation for how this relates to I guess a lot of things that we've actually discussed so far, which I having never actually read this chapter in a detail, I wasn't actually expecting, but it's kind of quite reassuring to see that like you know i feel like we've we've got we've we've discussed some of the elements here already before um and yeah if anyone if we get lost or if anybody else gets lost as listeners you can always go back to those previous episodes we've at least <laughs> broken these things down into different elements but but it's interesting to see them all come together in this way at that sort of scale i think yeah i just have a quick observation in that like i mean one of the key figures that they're dealing with both in terms of channeling but also countering is the um kind of the 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 big you know the big name of war scholarship which is of course Clausewitz and Clausewitz is one of his pre like key preoccupations was with uh with the, with the idea of chance and the chaotic nature of war and you know the the various coming together of you know um non-controllable elements uh, so i guess you know they've um they've just sort of retained that mindset while also challenging Clausewitz on a number of key points but mm. Clausewitz also did that himself but i i don't know i can i can clarify that but it may not have time for it. but yeah sean you were no no i was, no? I, was I was handing it over to you yeah. oh, okay cool um well i mean uh yeah as in so i don't know, i guess to pick up the point about good cop bad cop and um and yeah, and the state, um, and the state as like kind of like enforcement, you know, with the, the crime analogy you were drawing, uh, like state and enforcement of law, um, because you know that's if we're going to the kind of barbarian definition of statehood, it is just like the legitimate monopoly on violence. Mm. Uh, but yeah, um, but yeah, and then like that contrasted with the law itself, and that is essentially like that's the dual duality of like the existence of the state that is, you know, comprises those two heads. It's like the actual kind of like 
the the authority and the actual man the the logistics to actually carry out these things the the physical power and then the kind of legitimating intellectual power uh represented by the law and represented by the kind of like the the philosophical foundations that emphasize you know clarify what a state actually is and um even though this is a point that um they actually go against um well you know, I, I would just stress at this point, it's like the concept of a state is a very recent one and a you know, re- recent one in, in definitely mm. in terms of like the time time scales we discuss that's covered in this text. Mm. Um, yeah, but, that, that's something yeah. you'd like to pick up later. Yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, it's like, yeah, absolutely. But um, I mean, it's I, I don't even know what to link it to, but like the fact that they do point out that like, yeah, no, even though, yes, yeah, states are a recent invention, the Earth state has always existed. That's always a bit been a thing that um, they're they're drawing on clusters, I think, when they're talking about this, that has always existed or was always going to exist. Um, Mm -hmm. That's something I want to, I guess, yeah, definitely pick up on later because I think that's that's too kind of key to, like, overlook. But just returning to the good cop, bad cop analogy and, like, uh, where that fits in to my kind of experience of um, politics and war and, like, um, political science and war is, like, it's basically... um, well, we covered this in the planning session, but um, I found that like the most pertinent thing that came up for me was the con- this concept of the deep state uh, or mm-hmm. the parapolitical. Um, the lobby, uh, if you The will. lobby, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, it's the lobby is one element of it. I mean, the parapolitical is its own kind of assemblage, I guess. But um, well, the, yeah, 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 yeah. But basically, that. basically, basically. Um, yeah. So. The, the the existence of the liberal state of which, you know, war is a key part, it's one of the most essential things to understand is that it exists as it exists as this kind of like struggling entity um, that is, uh, sus- you know, pretty much composed entirely of its own contradictions. It's this idea that um, well, one, it's a sort of democracy, so it has to um, represent a kind of like a collective um, will. But at the same time, um, that rules out this idea that like there is a single kind of sovereign actor at the top of it who um, who is able to kind of express things in a personal sense. But also this concept of sovereignty must exist. And um, and also it's just, I mean, the... the the found you know the um uh, the most straightforward definition of the deep state i i can really give is this idea that um in order to well in order for the state to exist its legitimating ideology stresses the equality of people you know this is the post enlightenment uh modern state it, it stresses the equality of people and the um and the idea of human rights as its central tenet that all um functions of the state center around um and you know it's kind of that's how it's able to sustain itself that's it's kind of like nation thing but um in order for that to exist uh it must simultaneously do a number of you can be continually doing things that are outright contrary to this uh principle basically uh by um by uh, reversing these ideas, having a kind of necessary calculus of death that it applies to uh, both people within and more often than not outside of that state. Um, and in order to um, overcome these contradictions or at least kind of like suppress them long enough to continue functioning, uh, what develops is this thing called the deep state, which is um, represented by unelected security figures by kind of secretive forces that are given objectives uh but more or less their own license to um their own license to uh carry them out or achieve these objectives um by means that just go unscrutinized and um and yeah and sort of um are are kind of kept separate from the um uh, well, are kept separate from the um, functions of the democratic, you know, um, non-secret state, you know, the surface level state, um, in a way that's it's not just, you know, functionally separate. It's this idea that the state constantly emphasizes, no, this is separate. You can't think of our democratically accountable actions in the same way as you do 
these this thing that just exists just so we can have the freedom to do these democratically accountable actions. And we see, and, well, but like never, and yeah, the classic example of this from you know, recent history is uh, the extraordinary rendition. You know, so the construction, yeah. the construction yeah. of the of the torture camp outside of the contiguous territory of the state. Yes, mm-hmm. um, and yeah, and yeah. So that so you know, Guantanamo Bay, the CIA, um, and I mean, is this the is this the point? I guess. I kind of want to draw in the the chess versus go analogy yeah, simply because, do, yeah. like, yeah, this is this is where and because I've, I've got those before examples. you do just just want yeah. to get, make sure that everybody has an opportunity if they have anything they want to say to in response to that before we we good. Yeah, we're good. I had picked up on the same like deep state um, kind of thread, but apart from like a, a chunky chunky quote that's not necessarily needed. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> not much more to add. Yeah. Okay. So. I guess, like, um, this, well, I've got, like, a couple of examples I wanted to kind of highlight of where I see this war machine existing in realms of the modern state. And I know I keep saying the state as a general term, but I am talking about America because we are, you know, <laughs> every, my, yeah. our entire frame, it doesn't have to be, but our entire frame of reference for this is the unipolar world of the post-Cold War, which I feel like um, this text in question was eerily pre you know pre meditating in, in well not pre meditating you know like foreshadowing in a number of interesting ways mm. um but yeah so like the modern examples so Sean mentioned the lobby I think that's quite a good one um because so the lobby is basic actually no not the lobby and the blob the blob is um blobby yeah blobby <laughs> um, yeah uh so the idea of the blob i forget the name but it was actually someone who was part of um the um obama cabinet who um talked to who basically identified this thing where I, I, i'm going to be drawing okay so in order to explain this i'm, I'm going to draw on the kind of like Foucauldian idea of like discourse and in its bearish sense in the idea that like Establishing the discourse, establishing a primary over a discourse is um, a pre- prerequisite to exercising power. And the discourse in this sense is basically, um, well, that that function in, in relation to the American presidency is this fact that, um, yes, a presidency, an administration can decide technically on whatever foreign policy it decides. However... Um, in order to do so, it has to make these judgments based on, you know, uh, based on a number of uh, extremely educated um, research and evidence-backed, nominally, <laughs> um, uh, arguments and, and, you know, tested hypotheses and things. And uh, the blob is, well, and, and, and so what the blob tends to, is, comprises of is like mil- uh, a combination of kind of like researchers, uh, j- journalists sometimes, military thinkers, generals and academics who um, establish, no, these are the terms of the discourse. And by doing so, establish a very kind of limited number of pathways an administration can actually, uh, you know, exert sovereign act, sovereign decision in a particular direction through. Um, and so that's kind of, that's this idea that like yes we you know we elect a president well we not we but <laughs> a president is elected to carry out a particular will uh but th- that will is only ever following the democratic mandate to a certain extent because um because its will is filtered through um a wholly other thing um and 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 the point the, the reason why i connect that to the deep state um uh, or no to connect that to the war machine is um one of the th- key things that they stress about i think three quarters of the way through the book is the fact that the war machine is fundamentally sort of apolitical or it's it's not that it's like detached from it so much as all of its functions are just absolutely um are just a uh, function in relation to other elements of the state to the kind of its power rather than its kind of political or or ideological objectives or preoccupations. Um, I think, yeah, I'm drifting, but um, I don't know, maybe... maybe... Do you want to talk about Go? Yes, I want to talk... Okay, yeah, so the chess Go analogy, Mm -hmm. that's something that comes up quite early on in the text. Um, It's this idea that, like, 
we conceive of uh, war as being like chess. So there's a series of actors that are permitted um, directions they can go in and um, have specific objectives <laughs> and can be thought about in varying levels of complexity, but essentially it's kind of predictable and rules-based. However, Each piece has a like, defined action. Has a defined yeah. function, yeah. And the crucial difference with Go is it's a series of kind of in- interchangeable identical pieces whose, um, whose function depends on the situation they're placed in. Um, and I just figured, I just felt that this had a very useful application to how we think about war. Um, and I think my, my, my way of briefly summing this up was this idea that uh, when things are placed in a war situation, uh, you know, by you know, military actors and, and resources and things, they are framed as chess pieces and the democratic pro- you know, the democratically mandated process that leads to them being put into play um, is done with the rhetoric of chess, uh, but they will always become go pieces once they're there uh, because of the fundamentally chaotic and unpredictable nature of war. Um, and yeah, I, I just like... Mm. If we want to talk about kind of like real world examples of this, um, we see this in... Um, in things like, well, Blackwater, sort of private security firms, I think is like possibly a very good um, example of this because they're nominally there fulfilling the function of a state, but their function uh, go is just fundamentally opposed to the sort of the spirit and the letter of the laws that sent them there. But also, um, also, I think the main thing is uh, SEAL Team 6, I think was the, the biggest example. I, I looked this up. This is kind of based on... Um, Based on an on an article I read in the Intercept you know, in preparation for this, it's called "The Crimes of SEAL Team 6, But one of the most kind of like um, pertinent elements of that is, and this is you know, this this I recommend going away and reading because this is like fully like war machine territory. The fact that um, the higher up they go, the higher kind of the mo- they're seen as you know the highest and most elite form of the U.S. military, and they are state sanctioned, but. Uh, the further they, it feels like the further they get into this kind of military space, um, the further they get from the markers of civilization. Like they mm. commit, you know, um, they're like shithole soldiers, and they're, <laughs> you know, they, what they do is very, 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 you know, they're very good at what they do. But their whole thing is like resisting um, the markers associated with traditional kind of military culture. So they kind of like, I think. Um, they, well, basically, you know, people talk about them like having no idea who they are. They just mysteriously appear like the Space Marines or oh. something. <laughs> and, and, and they look like a biker gang. Like, yeah. Yeah, what that's, exactly saying, what I, that's exactly what I was going to say. Like, they, they sp- specifically go against the uh, military regs by being, like, one of the few units allowed to, like, grow beards and get themselves covered in tattoos and all that sort of thing. Like, yeah. it's a very deliberate and, attempt to uh, differentiate themselves from the standard military. And there was actually, like, a branch of them that, um, their symbol, their kind of, like, you know, team logo was a, uh, tomahawk, um, which is, again, like, you know, channeling kind of ancient nomadic warriors that they, uh, kind of idealized. But there was this story that's actually detailed in the article. Uh, Sean, you've got it up. What was, who's the author? Uh, let's, sorry, just open up the uh, tab again. It's, um... I have two remaining free articles to read. Uh, it's uh, yeah, Matthew I love that Cole. guy. Matthew Cole, yeah. But basically, um, they had, like, a tomahawk insignia, and then, like, they got a bunch of, like, replica tomahawks just made of fucking, like, I think they're just made of solid metal, made um, as sort of, like, uh, team, you know, trophy things. But um, these were never intended for use in combat, but they started just, like, wearing them out into the field and actually using them to break down doors or just using them in, uh, in hand-to-hand combat. And it's like, they're still there representing, you know, the protection of freedom and the promotion of democracy. But somehow we got from that to um, this just, like, weird sort of, like, yeah, intense, strange savagery. And, yeah, and I, I think that's just... That is that um, process of transformation through war that gets, that somehow kind of like is tenuously linked to the state and sustains the state, but is so far opposed to what the state nominally represents in its, um, in its le- legal 
I you think... know, legitimizing ideology called yeah. the situation. If, <laughs> if I can bring in a, like a, a not a counter example, but sort of like a, a complementary example, you can say the same of of, of uh, intelligence services as well mm-hmm. that they play this role of being kind of like one foot in, one foot out uh, outside of uh, the state and its apparatus. You know, and this is um, um, that they. Yeah, the way that an intelligence service acts is through like it's duplicitous. It's kind of like would be viewed classically as being dishonourable because it is about it's about deception, it's about dissimulation, uh, and about you know calculated acts of cruelty as well. In a way that um, you know um, a good soldier isn't meant to act, but these are also absolutely necessary elements of the security apparatus of the state. It's how like it is what keeps the state. Uh, functioning through these acts of deception, through these acts of dissimulation, and actually, like a figure who comes to mind of of who actually like embodies a lot of these manifestations, I think, is um, the figure of the jackal from the film Day of the Jackal, where he we never, um, which is very, is a very good like classic sort of like seventies like espionage thriller about uh, an assassin who's hired by the um, OAS, the secret Ar- the uh, secret army organization in France, the uh, the, the military sort of like the the uh, the, mili- the far right military group who didn't want France to grant Algeria independence, and uh, they hire him to assassinate Charles de Gaulle. And over the course of this film, we never actually find, like, really know who this guy is. We never learn what his name is, even. Uh, and we just sort of like follow this, like, the assassin as he sort of like assumes different identities and goes through like these different, like, almost like becomings, seducing, like, seducing sort of like women and seducing men as well, in order just to get where he needs to be on the day when he will get a clear shot at Charles de Gaulle. Because this is something that they emphasise in the text, is that, you know, that within the war, the, the war machine is this constant sort of act of, like, becoming as well. And, like, and you can see... And, you know, because of, like, the tensions that will always exist between, like, the striated state and, like, the reality of, sort of, like, the fluid becomingness of the war machine, you always do find these sort of, like, moments of tension. Like, like you know, and, and you know, I am, I am going to just queer all of this, as is, as is my <laughs> one. Yeah, so the fact that, you know, like, you have a, you know military environments being overwhelmingly male without w- women tending to be involved it means there's like always going to be loads of like gay sex happening because you just get loads of sort of like very very fit men under extremely stressful conditions in this tight space with each other for prolonged periods of time but that's not the, that's not something you can like talk about though even though it's obvious that this is this is a reality you know you know and you know, obviously in the united states for, you know, for decades the policy was just one of like don't ask don't tell like we know this is a thing but we can't talk about it because that would be to to, to legitimize this kind of like a shifting of identity a shifting of becoming and um it's interesting as well that the knights templar who are one of the like probably like the most famous examples of that kind of like quasi nomadic machinic like war of assemblage which again sort of like has a like has a relationship with church and state with you know the binding and the despotic forces of a european society but we're also being somewhat outside of that and being kind of like answering to itself a lot of the time as well and i, and I believe i do bring up uh, urban knights templar in, in in this essay as well and when it comes to sort of like the crimes that they are accused of when it became politically expedient to destroy them it includes like you know not only like worshipping sort of like foreign gods and like worshipping baphomet they are accused of sodomy and so on and which probably like wasn't a false accusation either because like it's d- d- dudes be dudes you know they they, um, they forgot that what goes on tour stays on tour so you know <laughs> <laughs> what happens in the holy land stays in the holy land <laughs> <laughs> uh right. did you want to did you want was there more that you wanted to carry I, on this I, or should i, I, I there, I mean, there is like loads else? i want to bring in but like maybe i can sort of bring it in at different stages i feel like okay i feel like um, i've done lots of fun <laughs> All right, Corey, do you want to take the lead for a little bit? Then I'll throw it back over to Matt. And then I've got some madness about Heidegger I want to talk about. Sure. Do we want to uh, roll into um, <clears throat> the way I was kind of reading this as about being about the US military in the modern day? Or do we want to go to smooth spaces? Yes. Versus... All right. Great. <laughs> Which it, well, we can do both. You know, well, like, yeah. Uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll get there eventually. <laughs> All right, yeah, so, like, it's probably not surprising that, as I said, I was just thinking of, like, the modern U.S. military um, in discussing, you know, the war machine reading this chapter. Um, And there was a quote in particular um, that kind of jumped out at me. Um, 
It is enough to affirm that the war machine is external to the apparatus. It is necessary to reach the point of conceiving the war machine as itself a pure form of exteriority, whereas the state apparatus constitutes the form of interiority we habitually take as a model, or according to which we are in the habit of thinking. And just the idea of the war machine being like uh, completely exterior to the state, um, yeah, that oh, that just put me in mind of in US for sure. So. Um, um, yeah, the U.S. and American mil uh, imperialism in the Middle East. And so um, with the situation in Afghanistan, with the U.S. pulling out after 20 years, um, a lot of people have been referencing Vietnam, so I'm going to do the same. And I'm prob I promise I won't be as bad as uh, most of them are. Um, so, like, with Vietnam, it was truly, like, the U.S., going to war it was the state going to war um like the draft meant that a lot of young men were sent to fight regardless of their own feelings about um that war or war in general uh, it was a highly televised event so the public did have some idea of what was happening and the war itself like weighed very heavily on political discussions and on elections all throughout the war so you compare that to 20 years in afghanistan nowadays there's no draft uh, so the people who go over to fight have volunteered to do so, though, of course, economic realities being what they are. Uh, I don't know if you can really call it volunteering a lot of the time. Um, but even beyond that, I'll, you know, we're seeing uh, more and more that these wars are being privatized. So Afghanistan doesn't look like a war fought by the state. It looks like it's one that's um, fought purely by the state's military apparatus or um the uh, military institution, as they call it in the uh, in the essay, um, and further to that idea of the uh, military uh, exteriority, um, there's a fact that I, I think a lot of people probably aren't familiar with, and that's that um, on the rare occasions when the U.S. does deign to sign on to some climate change agreement, there's always a carve out where the U.S. military is exempt from any restrictions that are being placed on the homeland. So it doesn't matter how how much like American industry and American consumers actually uh, like decrease their own uh, carbon footprints or whatever you want to however you want to say the military itself is just out there polluting and uh, looting all that shit and there's just they're held they're not held to account at all in any way. Um, they grant and yeah they're granted um, an, uh, an enormous amount of independence in lots of ways you know, and this mm. is uh, maybe slightly tangential but one like infamously um, films like for example the Transformers films also, <laughs> which feature the US military a lot uh, are allowed the, mili the US military if they like the script if they feel that it is a flattering portrayal of them we'll just let them use like oh yeah you can use our tanks and our battleships mm. and guns for free like we'll just, we'll just do that it's because the same with the Marvel movies too yeah, yeah, exactly, because it because uh, it is well, it's the military's own propaganda apparatus, mm. you know. Sort of, um, yeah, uh, they put it very well. They put it sort of like very honestly, sort of like, well, when would you like to make sure that you get the details right? Um, <laughs> but yeah, and, and yeah, that's the blob. You know? Yeah, exactly. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's like yeah. Let me show you. You know, you just like um, so you know how it's done. You know, this is how we do it. And there was oh fuck no slight tangent. I just wanted to bring in so like. Uh, the blob, what, one of the main sources like understanding about the blob is via Stephen, uh, a political science scholar called Stephen Walt. Uh, but I came, I came across the book by Stephen Walt through a review of it, uh, conduct and a fairly kind of like stridently, um, like, viscer you know, uh, eviscerating review by a guy called Josh something who. Uh, is now part of like the Blinken War Administration under wait, War Office under Biden, and was like right hand man to Hillary Clinton during um, th some of her most like kind of uh, notorious actions regarding Libya. Mm. Uh, but basically, he pretty much outright says like, yeah, Stephen Walt, he's a good academic, but really, you know, you can't comment on this with any authority unless you are actually in those planning meetings in those situation rooms <laughs> and it's like yeah so the, the blob protects its own basically mm. it's, it's i mean 
I finished like my umpteenth rewatch of The Sopranos recently, <laughs> and so it does just remind me a little bit of that, you know, sort of like something that they emphasize is basically like, you know, they, they can't ever call it the mafia. It's they they never refer to it as anything except our thing. And um, but one of the things they emphasize, you know, this is a face to face business. We do not do like we do phone calls when we need to. We do not leave messages or emails or anything like that. It, and it's uh, the same kind of thing with these lobbying groups with the blob and and so on. They exist for as much. You know, they exist when we're all in the same room together. It's Jake Sullivan, by the way. Jake. Sullivan thing. Yeah. Um, I had a, a bit of a, a point which I, I think I can make relatively succinctly. Please um, do. Basically, <laughs> yeah, like the important thing you mentioned with like, so this is, um, I don't know, I guess give it a bit of like uh, chronology. So this was written in 1986, taking place in the kind of like post Vietnam kind of uncertainty, but um, with the mounting reaffirmation of those kind of like uh, America centric certainties through like because you know, this is peak Reagan era, right? So um, one of the one of the interesting kind of like switches that came between um, well Vietnam was kind of seen as like the the falling apart or like kind of the disproving of certainties regarding states and their capacity to fight a modern war and this was then like later followed by uh the iraq war which is um is like described as being <clears throat> the thing that finally ended vietnam syndrome the idea that you know the which the kind of war do you mean do you mean the first the first one yeah the, gulf, the first gulf because war. the first gulf war so, so, yeah, uh, so yeah, yeah, yeah the kuwait conflict really the war against saddam hussein's iraq following the invasion of mm. kuwait but, yeah, um, with the cameras on but, the bombs for that yeah, yeah. proper televised uh, war Totally. And this is kind of like an important kind of moment between those two things uh, that I kind of, well, two things I wanted to flag up. One, like, yeah, as you mentioned, yeah, the the, the kind of visuals of war changing. Um, I talked earlier about like Clausewitz um, and his emphasis on uh, fundamentally kind of like chance based or chaotic uh, thing that happened it, that takes place kind of in, um, in war. The fact that like uh, we can't really know the outcome i mean that 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 has its own challenges which if we do have time i hope i can like address but what i wanted to focus on here was the idea that like vietnam vietnam was the first war where they really rigorously wanted to apply principles of cybernetics uh so kind mm. of like this idea that they could like mo computer model things have like all very elaborate breakdowns of maths essentially this big protracted effort to turn the go game of the Vietnam War back into a chess game, mm. and um, and that failed spectacularly in in Vietnam, but kind of you know uh, did pretty well in in Kuwait because it was a very different war. Uh, it's but, interesting, like yeah. like one one thing to compare between the two actually is how is is the time the times involved? Yeah, because I have a hope in here. The first uh, Vietnam was ten years. No, it's longer because right. the, 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 the oh, like, fuck, no. yeah, sort of like because the first Gulf War lasted one month, one week, and four days, while Vietnam lasted nineteen years. No, 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 no. no one knows that. <laughs> what song? Jesus Christ, the song 19. You know, the song like the average age of a soldier in Vietnam oh. is 19. 19. No, 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 no. Yeah. I'm editing that out because none of you found it funny and I have my <laughs> reputation yeah. to maintain. I, I don't think I've even but, heard that what's... song before. Who's it by? Jesus Christ. I closing. Closing. It's, like... <laughs> it's the song for the closing um, of the podcast yeah, episode. Credits. <laughs> Anyway, okay. the but um, the sorry, what I wanted to just just say on the serious thing about like type about uh, like and this is actually something that we can compare between sort of like Afghanistan and Vietnam is you know Afghanistan lasts twenty years you know it lasts longer than the Vietnam War, while the Gulf War you know the Gulf War is it, like the success of that is really tied into the idea of it's like brevity and it's like specificity you know sort mm. of like it's no we this is like the highly technologically advanced mm. uh, war that's being fought rather than this sort of strange hybrid conflict like with Vietnam where you have this mixture of like different um, stratagems sort of like smashing into one another. It is It is also worth pointing out that like a lot of the intense specificity of the first uh, Iraq conflict was bullshit. Like they've been like, oh yeah, like, <laughs> oh, yeah. like, like it was all surgical strikes, like zero civilian casualties and stuff. And it's like, no, they were like about 10% of like, or, like no, about fucking 1% of the stuff that was broadcast relentlessly on the news. It's like, look how like, you know, these computer guided missiles and stuff. But like, no, a lot of it was just like straight up like trad bunker busters. Let's just, you know, um, 
a lot of it was unguided and claimed a lot of fucking collateral, but that just wasn't televised. Yeah, like look uh, up the fucking the highway of death, you know, yeah. like mm-hmm. stuff like you know, because yeah, mm-hmm. and it's the same. It's the same. It's exactly mm-hmm. the same now. Sort of like you know, like um, you know, the drones. The whole like rationale behind drone strikes is you know again sort of like old oh, navies, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and they use words like you know obviously surgical strike and so mm-hmm. on, and but they're not. You know, it is just sort of like yeah, we just blew up another wedding. You know, it's but, yeah. I think it's like, I, I just, I'm just saying, like, I also just wanted to backtrack a little bit. I wasn't like countering your point. I'm saying like, you know, that is, that specificity no, is still were, relevant no. in terms of, you know, the theme of this war in terms of how it's remembered. Mm. Um, but yeah, like the other key thing I wanted to flag up about the importance of the first Gulf War, which like obviously hadn't happened when this text was being read, but was being written. But um, the one of the key things about that, and this is actually, I think, Bo- is it Baudrillard who did the Gulf War? Did not, yeah. will not, and is not going to take place. But yeah, basically, the key thing with that is this idea that that was when there was a big switch in the status of war uh, from previously military build-up and you know the whole military-industrial complex. The 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 kind of the justifying principle surrounding that was deterrence. That it was like we're this powerful, so people don't challenge us, and. Um, there's a line he said which is like really interesting which is like the principle of deterrence has shifted following the end of the cold war it's no longer to deter enemies so much as like to uh for america to deter itself for the unipolar global sovereign to like stop itself from doing war Mm. um and then you know a lot of the 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 kind of political science of like you know uh political rhetoric surrounding war became like how do we decide on the exception from that process of self-deterrence uh but yeah i don't know i just like i thought that was that was this pretty pertinent mm. um i also like do we have more about cap like the relationship of capitalism because i think this is something um, we should go into well, probably <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe we should come back to that after science because like we want to talk about science and science and capital have a a relationship that does require some unpacking. Who was talking about science? Well, I have my Maths. stuff about. This is kind of like quite tangential to what we've been established so far. Okay. It's just the stuff I really wanted to talk about, so I'm saving my bit for the end because it's not especially relevant to the conversation <laughs> we've had so okay. far. Um, Corey, do you want to maybe? Um, actually, no. I'm gonna. Well, I'm gonna throw this back over to Matt um, because we've not heard, we've not heard from you for a while. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, Matt, uh, capitalism and war. Go. <laughs> Shit. Um, I mean, maybe there's a way that I can. Maybe there's a bridge here. Um, because the one thing that I, I think of, at least in terms of this link between how this text relates to modern warfare, um, I guess one of the most notorious things about this chapter in particular, having a very literal connection to modern warfare, is how it's supposedly used by the IDF um, mm. uh, in their the dealings with between Israel and Palestine. Um, and there's, there's, well, I was going to say there's a really interesting essay that um, A. R. Weisman has written on this for isn't as years ago. I think it maybe was where this debate or this question of how useful Deleuze and Guattari are to modern, um, what was going to say? I was going to say warists. I don't know people that <laughs> wage war. It's not really states, I guess, is the point. Yeah, warmongers. Warmongers is probably the best way to do it. Anyway, it's called the Art of War. Um, it was on. War um, Freeze. Um, we can maybe put a link in our like show notes and stuff. <laughs> that was Iron Man, but also good. Oh, damn it! It's the same album. War pigs, of course, infamously rhyming masses with masses. Oh, mm. brilliant. And it works. It took me about fifteen years to realise that. But anyway, um, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. no. Um, I'm just thinking about war pigs now. Um, uh, anyway, um, but anyway, I... yeah, this, this. Uh, this um, this essay that Wiseman has really is really uh, interesting because he interviews this um, guy called Nave, who's a retired brigadier general with the IDF who now trains m- new and incoming members of the IDF, um, uh, and it's interesting how they sort of describe themselves. They sort of like this. Uh, they said that the, the institute that they it's called the Operational Theory Research Institute. Um, they describe themselves as we are like a Jesuit order um, that we attempt to teach and train soldiers to think. They read, yeah, Deleuze and Guattari, they read Gregory Bateson. Um, a lot of 
a lot of well, Dolls and the Chariot and their influences essentially. But it's interesting how they define what they're doing. Is that um, I just wanted to read this uh, Weizmann's definition of what a war machine is. Um, it says war machines, according to the philosophers, are polymorphous, diffuse organizations characterized by their capacity for metamorphosis, made up of small groups that split up or merge with one another depending on contingency and circumstances. I asked Narve why Deleuze and Guattari was so popular with the Israeli military. He replied that several of the concepts of the Thousand Plateaus became instrumental for us, allowing us to explain contemporary situations in a way that we could not have otherwise. It problematized our own paradigms. Most important was the distinction they have pointed out between the concepts of smooth and striated space, which accordingly reflect the organization, con organizational concepts of the war machine and the state apparatus. The IDF we now off in the IDF we now often use the term to smooth out space when we want to refer to operation in a space as if it has no borders. Palestinian areas could indeed be thought of as striated in the sense that they are enclosed by fences, walls, ditches, roadblocks and so on. When I ask him if moving through walls was part of it, he explains that in Nablus the IDF understood urban fighting as a spatial problem. Travelling through walls is a simple mechanical solution that connects theory to praxis. Um, I feel like that's kind of lurking in the background of a lot of what we've just been talking about, especially, I mean, I, I, I can't say I'm much of an expert at all on any kind of modern conflict, but at least even watching, I guess, how Israel and Palestine interact, even the recent like war in Afghanistan that now, I guess, has weirdly come to an end. But I guess you can maybe even see that, like, I guess, because I just, it's in my head just because it's been in the news so much recently, but this sense that the, the American occupation of Afghanistan kind of created, did the opposite of what the idea of talking about. It created these kind of pseudo American enclaves where um, a kind of a Western democracy could maybe sprout sort of embryonically. Whereas you have the Taliban outside of those areas that doesn't really seem to care so much about borders in the same way that the american state does uh or i guess whatever their influence is on on the Af afghani government um but it's interesting how that sort of shows them in a similar way maybe to what it was like in vietnam like you have the guess that the whole the whole thing about guerrilla warfare in vietnam being that sense that um uh the the vietnamese uh fighters through in the jungle um had no sense of borders the way it kind of gets then like um uh narrativized in like i get, i just always think of predator <laughs> like literally having a kind of uh if not a blob at least a kind of invisible being that doesn't have a defined form until very later on and even then is just like kind of horrifying because it doesn't resemble anything that's could be terrestrial um the, and this the, is yeah, so of course, you know, sort of like neither does the United States, you know, actually like need to care about borders, you know, they, you know, sort of like with the bombing of, you know, the bombing of Cambodia, you know, sort of like a, a country that was neutral in the conflict. And this is, yeah, and, it, and you know, we might even want to, maybe we shouldn't go in this direction because it's, it's this whole thing, but you know, it's it, a lot of this, it feels like in the background of a lot of, the, a lot of this is the notion of the state of exception, you know, that, um, but but the but the war machine, whether that be you know SEAL Team Six, or if that be the intelligence apparatus, or if it just be like fucking bombing campaigns, like or it kind of like like I get like I've been saying, you know, exists with one foot in the state, one foot out of it, in this kind of exceptional space where it's able to, where you know it doesn't really need to care about you know with about the striation of the spaces and this all the smoothness of the yeah. spaces where we can just move between them. And this is, you know, and well. I guess that's the that's the kind of I guess that's the thing about smooth space, right? Is it's not it's I guess that's kind of what I wanted to try and bring out and kind of rambling around it, but that they're, they're they're not a dichotomy. As if to say that like um smooth space is like it's it I guess it's like they're not fixed. You have striated space, which is organized space, and then smooth space is kind of like space that smooths outwards, as if you get like to the edges of something and the edges are less defined. Like not in the sense that borders are literal. That the United States doesn't care about borders, but that it's actually always whether for itself or the places that it occupies, it's in a constant state of metamorphosis. Um which I guess you see that Israel does most sort of successfully and horrifically. There as if to say that um 
the kind of maybe limb. I mean, not that I'm just going to immediately explain the Pakistani Israeli conflict, yeah. but <laughs> you've got three minutes. Just but, <laughs> get it summarized for us. But, it but I guess more the, than five letters. The, but, but I guess there's this like the, the the weird tension if there is one that's relevant to this conversation is that like um, uh, the that that state of exception. I mean, again, not to maybe even use that specific phrase, but. That it's something that works both ways, right? Like, as if Israel has been established as a state for what, a long time now. Um, 70 years. Yeah, right, I was going to say, coming up to almost a century. But despite that, you would have, like, this sense that um, it's it's a state that's in a constant... It's in a constant... State, again, the wrong word. In a constant, <laughs> like, state of formation. Um, it's never finished, um, and that, in a way, both gives it legitimacy to keep doing what it wants to do, but then also allows space for it to be challenged as like not being legitimate enough. And I guess when you have something like the US, the US like tries to do that same thing, but it can't do it within its own borders so much anymore. So it has to go elsewhere, and it's always in this state of it's always just trying to produce states um, by mm-hmm. its own kind of model. But that, I guess, what that means is that you always have to have that the smooth, but the smoothing out of space, that kind of. They're traveling through walls, not in the sense of like literal borders, but you always have to have a kind of maybe not even like a neutral zone, but at least at least a space that you can expand into. Um, and it's kind of that um, sort of disputed space, which is like, well, I guess, where that's the, that's the sort of natural home of the war machine of the nomad. Um, that's mm-hmm. kind of, yeah, in clamps between whatever is the form of the state as we understand it and its content, which often exceeds that form. Um, but yeah, I just, I guess I just wanted to throw, throw that in that it's fascinating how that, and well, I mean, yeah, to kind of get back to what we're talking about, if we're talking about the war machine and capital, capitalism functions the same way, right? There's, uh, we talk about, is there an outside to capitalism? We can kind of say, no, it's an imminent system at this point. Um, but that kind of is the tension of how, um, uh, of, uh, well, capitalist realism, that we have this this kind of fixed idea of what capitalism is and how it functions, but for it to function in a way and to sustain itself, it has to have this kind of blurry zone for where it can expand into. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's kind of that, that I wouldn't, yeah, if if because I guess it's it's not so much a state of exception in this deleuze Guattarian context, maybe like a, a sort of area of excess. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm. And whatever that excess is, whether I mean, you can see that literally in terms of like surplus value. Um, talk about how I mean, I guess yeah, it can work both ways. We could talk about the uh, what is the the, the n- nomadology is at like the surplus value of war. Maybe that's something that you could say. Mm. Um, so I mean, maybe that don't know how that, how that correlates, but you know, there's uh, maybe, maybe Lucy, you can expand on that. But um, yeah. yeah, I guess I guess that's kind of the point, right? If there's if there's a relationship between nomadology and capitalism here, it's that you know the logic of capitalism also needs that space for itself to expand into. But the problem is that that's it, like like Israel Palestine, it 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 it, it allows something to c- c- keep forming itself, but also create space for it to be delegitimized. It's always in a state of it's it's a state of contention, maybe a space of contention. Hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, I had um, I had a uh, a point that's probably this isn't the place to discuss it about like what I would define as the two headed nature of the Israel of the uh, state of Israel and the fact that it's like its legitimacy structure is torn between on the one hand um, a um, these aspersions to modern liberal democracy, but at the same time, a dual uh, legitimating structure based on some like pre-modern kingship. Uh, but that's that's for a different podcast, I think. But <laughs> um, but no, like the I guess like the um, where I would I think find this synthesis between like nomadology and, and capitalism uh, resides in one of the key things about. Um, where um what the key points where having followed Clausewitz in a lot of key directions they depart from him uh and one of the things they raise is the fact that um when Clausewitz was talking about war he was talking about like war in a in the sense that like kind of it's a limited exchange between European like, with between powers I mean he was talking about European powers but this is always this idea that well to use like his most famous phrase is uh 
war is a continuation of politics by other means, which is basically it's um it's the sense that it's um it's extending the kind of it's an extension of a relationship that pre-existed between these states, which was based on kind of trade, it was based on like kind of like supremacy in that trade, in cornering markets, in getting, um, in sort of like bolstering its own like resources and populations in that way. And so, conceived of war as something um, diff, as something you know that was by necessity limited, because if you go further and wage outright total war, then you're erasing a trading partner, and then can't go back to. Um, the supposedly continuous situation, but the reverse, um, the reverse that uh, Deleuze and Guattari bring in, um, which you know breaks the uh, limitingly kind of Eurocentric element of uh, Clausewitz's reading, which or reasoning, is this sense that um, well they they reverse the dictum. They say like politics is a continuation of war by other means, and um, flag up mm. the fact that. Uh, Clausewitz didn't really factor in logistics into his definition of warfare. The fact that peacetime, development of an economy, uh, you know, um, development of the state, uh, yeah, development of, you know, <laughs> the, the existence of the, the modern state is defined by um, its coexistence with the earliest stages of global capital. That's another, like, uh, big element of historical materialism we can't really get into here. But, um, the, the, the sense that what they emphasize is that by reversing that dictum, uh, politics is a continuation of war by other means. We're never not at war. We're always any kind of action taken by a state to stimulate an economy, to bring people together, to build infrastructure. There's always war waiting at the end of it because ultimately this all contributes to the uh, the logistics of warfare. Um, mm. So that's where I would that, that's where I would tie in capital. But I think um, there's there's a point I just absolutely couldn't, I couldn't let slip in this thing. It's just like, uh, returning to that timeline, how do we bring Afghanistan into this? And uh, I have with me a very important speech that Sean is currently reading over my shoulder. But um, <laughs> yeah, basically, um, so the Iraq War was for, you know, uh, the 90s were a period of like, what do we do in this unipolar moment? How can we figure shit out now? And this led to a very important speech delivered by Donald Rumsfeld, which, if you'll indulge me, I'm going to read out um, because this is a striking thing. He's, he's, this was to the Pentagon, you know, to the Joint Chiefs of Staff um, in the Pentagon. Um, this was when he was... Rumsfeld, was he... He wasn't sec he wasn't vice no, it was Cheney who was vice president. He was, he was secretary, secretary. He was secretary, sec secretary yeah. of defense. Secretary of defense. Um, and he re he says... The topic today is, and you know, this is, I should just say, like, you know, marking kind of the transition to modern warfare from the old certainties of the Cold War. Um, this is just like very, very pertinent. You know, he's flagging up that transition. He says, the topic today is an adversary that poses a threat, a serious threat to the United States of America. This adversary is one of the world's last bastions of central planning. It governs by dictating five-year plans from a single capital that attempts to impose its demands across time zones, continents, oceans, and beyond. With Amazon. brutal consistency, but with brutal consistency, it stifles, stifles free thought and crushes new ideas. It disrupts the defense of the United States and places the lives of men and women in uniform at risk. Perhaps this adversary sounds like the former Soviet Union, but that enemy is gone. Our foes are more subtle and implacable today. You may think I'm describing one of the decrepit dictators of the world, but their day too is almost past and they cannot match the strength and size of this adversary. The adversary is closer to home. It's the Pentagon bureaucracy. Not the people, but the processes. Not the civilians, but the systems. Not the men and women in uniform, but the uniformity of thought and action that would, um, to, we too often impose on them. Um, and this was Whoa. when he flagged, yeah, this is when I'm going to do the mass privatization of the state. I'm going to justify it on like hard neoliberal lines and say, like, no, business, should, business and capital should be concerned with the... Um, with the defense of the state, because businesses, if they, you know, governments kind of like can take a hit, but if a business takes a hit because of bad decisions, it fails. These things are far more dynamic because the logic of, you know, the, the great thinking machine of global capital makes them thus, and that's, we should be privatizing the military to put it in the hands of those best qualified for the go game of war. And um, so, yeah, that, that, and that was basically, well, I don't know, I think I just should point out the most crush crucial detail about. This was delivered in the Pentagon on September 10th, 2001. 
And oh my I, god! <laughs> yeah, I don't think we need to really stress what happened after that, but uh, but that followed the Afghan war, which has only just nominally come to a close, and later Iraq and Blackwater and SEAL Team Six and this podcast. September tenth. That's, that's <laughs> that is incredible. Yeah. <laughs> um. So yeah. I, so that's that's I... where I would connect the nomad to capital. Is okay. That, was that speech like when uh, Ozzy Mandias says, "Oh no, I've I've already done it thirty minutes ago"? <laughs> yeah. I <laughs> oh, signed legislation about that. Well, the Pentagon forever will begin crashing planes tomorrow. Um, <laughs> okay, so podcast viewer time, right? All right. Uh, I'm aware that the points that I prepared for this is actually on a completely different note from the entire conversations we've had already, because I just have loads of stuff about epistemology in Heidegger. Um, I don't think we could have a better ending than what Lucy's just done. So what I'm going to suggest is what I have here, I will at some point this week, I'll just sit in front of my microphone and basically just read this out on my own. There's a little like 10 minute, like 15 15 20 minute like little bonus thing that we'll mm-hmm. put out afterwards oh, we could do a part two I, well no no no, 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 no. <laughs> no okay no, edit that no, out no. um yeah so because i have stuff here which is like yeah it's not not i just went in a completely different direction be, um, with it because it just like this is the stuff that just like really jumped out at me and like made sense the stuff i've been reading recently so i'll do this as a set i'll do that as a separate thing that will come out like maybe even like the same day as we put this out or like a day after Woods mate or maybe uh okay so let's just um were there any like final 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 thoughts anyone wants to uh bring up or shall we just go have well we can go and have lunch and Corey can go to bed <laughs> <laughs> yeah there was uh something that um I remembered when Lucy was talking about uh, I think like the total war part and that was um just a, a quote from the essay um the war machine reforms a smooth space that now claims to control, to surround the entire earth. Total war itself is surpassed toward a form of peace more terrifying still. And I just thought that that phrase there is like really evocative. Um, it's like, it kind of reminds me of that William Gibson quote that's um, oft bastardized, and I'm going to do it again. Um, like, peace is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. Like in the West, <laughs> in the West we live in peace, but like the terrifying part is what's being done in our names elsewhere in the world. Um, yeah, that's so that really jumped out at me there. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Matt, do you have any final uh, thoughts, or are we uh, are we good? Um, yeah, I'm. I think actually, let me briefly. I clicked off my notes. I don't know why. Um, I think that's everything that I've even. Um, yeah, I guess I had like some extra. I, I, all I had was some extra sort of maybe further reading for people, but be interested in stuff. Well, Actually, yeah, uh, yeah, please uh, do. Like, just uh, and uh, we can include that as show notes as well. But if you just want to like, yeah, yeah, some yeah. Titles. I was gonna say, yeah. I yeah. just think. I, I mean, I recently read Harry Kunzru's Red Pill, um, which feels like mm. an because I, I noticed they kept bringing up Kleist in this. Um, mm. And that novel, deal, it's about like an academic who goes on like a sabbatical to Berlin to go and try and write a book, and gets into a weird hole of like getting into Kleist and um, ends up, I guess, like becoming embroiled in the 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 former deep state of like I guess um, which I never get mixed up East or West Germany, whichever was meant to be the bad one. <laughs> the good Germany was East Germany, the German Democratic yeah. Republic. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Right, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, but it's but that kind of uh, there was a lot of resonance in there, I think, because it, yeah, I think it's interesting how um, a lot of these ideas. I, again, that's it's just that point that I thought was going to be really heavily. Um, I don't know. I was just surprised how many. Um, I'm having a brain fart. Um, how many other things kind of fit in orbit of this that were kind of interesting. Anyway, but that's maybe an aside. Maybe that can also be some... That's a fun synchronicity, but, um... actually, because a friend, com- like, completely independently, like, um, a couple, only a couple of days ago, so our, our friend Max Luce, um, sort of basically just sort of sent me a picture of that book, that cover, asking me, do you know who's on the front of this? And I didn't, I didn't, because I don't know Kleist at all. And they got messaged, like, a, a couple of hours later, saying, oh, there's a guy called Kleist. It's like, oh, holy shit, I'm literally just reading about him right now. Synchronicities, hey! <laughs> um... Yeah, yeah, that's, that, that's it, that's all it was. <laughs> but, I mean, I, but, yeah, if, 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 I, yeah, if it, big, it, I recommend it as, like, a... Um, yeah, no, that's it. I just, I recommend it as, like, a... 
as a um, as a maybe some further reading. If you get maybe if you I'll get exhausted by nomadology and want something more recent than Kleist and Klaus and Klausowitz, <laughs> Harry comes through. <laughs> <laughs> Right. But yeah, we will, oh. I think we'll maybe have some substantial show notes for this, which would be kind of yeah. like cool. We'll have like a nice little list and that'll be cool yeah. to yeah, include. Yeah, I've cool. got a bunch okay, of stuff so... that we didn't get to. So yeah, keep an eye on yeah. the blog, peeps. Great. So we'll, we'll put that stuff up. Uh, and Luce, you, if you send, uh, send Matt actually, because he runs the, uh, runs the website, like any stuff huh? that you'd like to appear like, in written uh, form, yeah, if there is anything, links. you don't have to, you don't have to yeah. write things. All right, I'll yeah. get and, the links together. I got, I got the oh, links. Oh yeah, cool. And uh, yeah, cool. and I will like even in, in like sometime this week, I will record just like a little bonus episode where I talk about uh, royal and imperial science versus nomad and ambulatory science, which then goes on to me talking about Do Heidegger you? and becoming. Uh, okay, nice. cool, great. So. Uh, Lucy, I'd like to say a great big uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we wanted to have oh, you thank on. Thank you for guys ages. for having me. Well, Thanks, it's Lucy. It's always a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to have you on, <laughs> Lucy. Uh, whatever, pod- whatever podcast form it is. Uh, great, Lucy. Is there anything that you would you like to plug your new podcast? Okay. Well, we've only got one episode, and we may only be doing one episode until like I finish my masters. So this is kind of a there's a pilot out there. Um, which is, it's called Fugue States, and it's me and friend of the pod, Richard Havel, uh, talking, wait, me and friend of the pod, Rich, I don't know if he, actually no, his, 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 his name's in his Twitter handle, uh, yeah, he's, um, he's a good friend of ours, and we talk about, like, weird, uh, quirky, like, state building projects, and, um, and their various failures. We have one episode out, uh, which is about Galtz, Galtz, Chile, and a bunch of libertarians scamming each other and getting arrested. It's very fun. It's very fun. Uh, great. Okay, let's do the, uh, let's do the live Twitter handles. Matt, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me at Xenogothic, um, everywhere. It's the same right. everywhere. <laughs> Curry, where can people find you? Do you uh, have anything that you want to plug, or you got? Uh, have you got like, and you've got a one of your stories has been put in, into a new anthology, hasn't it? Yeah, you well, I've got. A, like... I'm working on a story for an anthology, but since the last episode, my novel Repo Virtual actually won the Aurealis Award for the best science fiction novel. So, hey, you. So, yeah, I'm really excited about that. Get it where you can get good books. Repo Virtual, that's its name. That name again is Repo Virtual. <laughs> And yeah, you can find me on Twitter at CJ White or my website is CoreyJWhite.com. Great. Uh, you can find me at Hauntonaut on Twitter and nowhere else. I do have a blog, which I've not written anything on for over a year and probably never will go back to. So there you go. Uh, and Lucy, your Twitter. And you can find me at Madame Curtis. Uh, so it's Madame underscore Curtis. Um, I was kind of keeping it off the air, but like, I, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. And you can <laughs> listen me. to, and if uh, you want more of Mona Lucy's sort of like anxious, frenetic energy, uh, then please listen to Weird Signal. We have a, we recorded a little uh, surprise little bonus episode last night, yeah. which we'll be, which we'll be putting up probably very, very quickly, actually, mm. hopefully. No uh, editing. No editing, no <laughs> editing. Uh, and uh, yeah, we have, uh, we'll be doing a little bit more of that sometime later this year. And uh, yeah, so... There we go. What do we have? A, we don't have a sign off, do we? I can't remember. <laughs> do we keep it? I don't know. Keep it buddy and stay organ like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't even think about having organs. <laughs> <laughs> Only if, you, if you have organs, then you're a fascist. Yeah. If you have organs, you're not our buddy. <laughs> Uh, thank you for joining us listeners and uh, we will be uh, by this with our organs we'll be uh, back you know, from, you know probably about a month from now we'll be uh, we'll trying to do part two of the folds which will be really hard and uh, we'll see where we go with that alright uh, thank you for your time everybody have a lovely rest of your day and see you, see you on the interwebs bye 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 bye, bye.